Praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. Before you take your seat, why don't we just open up with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy and grace. And we pray that you would simply be with us this evening. Lord, we need instruction. We need to hear from you. We pray that, Lord, as that you would fill my mouth and allow me to speak on your behalf. Touch your people, strengthen us, Lord God. We come against every distraction and every hindrance that may get in the way, Lord, that you may have free course. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. In the precious name of Jesus, everybody say amen. amen, and you may be seated. I welcome everyone to Wednesday night adult Bible study. We're thankful that we can assemble in his house and that we can learn. We're so thankful for sound doctrine. Can you just say thank you, Jesus? Amen. If it wasn't for sound doctrine, I don't know where I would be, and I'm thankful that God has given me an awesome teacher, and God has blessed me with an awesome man of God, um, as he has blessed you all with Bishop, and we're so thankful for what he's doing. Amen. This evening, I am going to teach on the subject of evidence of my faith. Evidence of my faith. I'm going to say something that I really want you to capture, and this phrase alone is almost a whole Bible study in itself, and I could just about say this and sit down. But what we believe is evident by what we eventually produce. What we believe is evident by what we eventually produce. Ephesians 2 and 8 and 9 tells us that we are saved through faith by grace. For salvation, faith in God through Christ Jesus, faith is required. For salvation, faith in God through Christ Jesus, faith is required. And since faith is the noted medium for salvation, we have to be careful for what we believe and how we believe it. What we believe and how we believe it. In Matthew 7 and 17, the scripture tells us, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. There are a lot of people that profess faith, Christianity, being Pentecostal or apostolic. But it doesn't matter how much you profess if you're not living it. If there is not fruit or if there is not proof in your life. That is not to say that maybe at the beginning stages you uh, may struggle to produce or to have any fruit. And that's all right. But we understand that in time, we're going to have to get to a place where what we believe or what we say catches up with uh, uh, what we believe by fruit. Can somebody say amen? So we can say this, that fruit is the, the determining factor when it comes to who you are. Everybody say fruit. You know, I, I, I've been uh, serving the Lord for a minute and... I've run across a lot of so-called ministers, so-called Christians, so-called believers. But you know, in time, you can tell if somebody really is a believer by their lifestyle, not just what you say. And I'm here to tell you that in time, you're going to see who's who. In time, you're going to find out whether somebody really is sold out, somebody really is following hard after Christ, or, you know, they, they may be here for, you know, some other reason, but I'm here to tell you that time will tell. I, I remember in different levels of, of leadership or ministry here with the choir or music where, you know, we, I, I would have to deal with problematic uh, members in, in our divisions or departments, and, and there were times that it was just, things were so challenging, but I, I, I've learned this one thing, that in time, God will handle it. <laughs> 
you know? Or there may be seasons in my life where I'm not exactly where I need to be. But guess what? God's going to speak to me so I can get it right so I can continue. Amen? And I'm thankful for his mercy. But in time, we're going to see exactly really what's on the inside. In saying that, I'll also say this, that there is a difference between, this might sound kind of funny, but between fruit and a fall. There is a difference. There's a distinction. A fall or a trip up does not determine who you are. Or should I say a mistake doesn't determine who you are. But fruit does because it is the end result of more than just one season. So fruit is going to tell off on who you are. There's going to be times where we struggle in our lives. There's going to be seasons, and they may be extended seasons, but the end result of, of true faith is going to be fruit. And many times it, it is our heart's desire to get things right when we're struggling. Or there may even be seasons of, of a prodigal state in our life. You know, in our youth where we're struggling with, you know, uh, uh, just, just things that young people struggle with. And, and I've been there. But I knew that, once I've made up my mind that I, I was going to serve him and I was going to give him everything. And, and I'm thankful that God allowed fruit to be produced out of my life. And yes, there were trip ups, there were falls, there were mistakes. But the Lord, his mercy was and grace was upon my life enough to where I could get back up. And I could testify of his goodness and not stay in that season, not stay in that state, not, not stay on the ground. But I'm thankful that there was enough faith that, that was in me to, to, to want to, to grow and to develop and to mature. Luke 6 and 45 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Recently, in the Christian news, we heard of a gospel singer, his name will not be mentioned right now, who was recorded for getting on one of his children, and his language was extremely foul, okay? It was not accidental, but it was foul, and unfortunately, his son recorded it and showed it to everybody, and that was a problem, but I'm bringing this up because his proficiency in his profanity led me to believe that he was not a first-time offender. <laughs> I mean, it was perfect in its form. It was grammatically correct. I mean, it was... <laughs> you knew that this was not his, his, his first attempt. In, in this language. But the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. Just because you can write a good song or, or, or you can preach a good message does not mean that in your heart there are things that, that are not right with God. Again, we have moments. Thank God there's not a camera around for all of our mistakes, right? We have moments when we slip up. Can somebody say amen? And there are moments like Peter where, where we deny him and we get into a place where we say something we shouldn't. But I'll, I'm here to say this. There is a distinction between a fall, a slip up, and something that is, you know, something that you're doing consistent. Something that you are practicing daily. There is a difference. And, and to me, this all has to do with understanding your level of faith how you believe in God, uh, uh, what you see him as. And that's what uh, I want to talk about this evening. Let's all turn to Matthew 25 and 14. I love this parable. I've, I've gained so many insights from this parable. It's the parable of the talents. And I'll start with verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And you know the story, the account is he gave one five talents, he gave the other two, and then he gave the other one. 
To the five talent servant, he doubled it. To the two talent, he as well doubled his. But to the one talent servant, the Bible says that he buried it. We can see in verse 18, it says, but he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Now listen, the Bible says that he gave these talents and he went away and then he came back. Well, the Lord returned with reward or judgment based on what the servants did with it. The Lord returned back with reward or judgment, but what the determining factor was what the servant did with what was given unto him. Verse 24 says, And he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art in hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And here's the key part I want you to catch. And I was afraid and went, and I hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there ha thou hast that is th thine. You see, his perspective of his Lord was that of fear. And he had an improper perspective of him. And it tells us that he was disobedient and he dishonored the giver of the gift. He said, I was afraid. Now, the Lord came back with either reward or judgment. But see, it was his perspective of him that caused him to be thrown into darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth and a problem, a prison. And a good part of what God has given me to speak on this evening is this. What is your perspective of the Lord? I really want you to, to, to really search your heart when, when you ask yourself this question because many of our decisions are based on how we perceive the Lord. He said, I see that there... This, this servant said, you're a hard man. You're an austere man. And I was afraid of you. And for that reason, I just didn't even try to invest. I didn't try to work. I didn't try to do anything. Sometimes our perspective of God is much that way. You know, you may think that God is just here to, to punish you. Or he's, he's a God that is just there. And you see him as a God simply of judgment. You see him as a God that doesn't put up with your mess, and, and, and for that reason, why should I even try to do anything in the kingdom? Well, I shouldn't even really try to praise him or try to worship him. But you have to realize that that's not who God is. He doesn't come just to beat you up, or he doesn't come just to judge you. But the scripture, even in this parable, teaches us he came back with either reward or with judgment. But it was this servant's perspective of his Lord that, that caused him to go and bury the talent. We are responsible with the things that have been given to us, but our perspective of God is going to determine our play, placement in the future. I, I will tell you, you know what compels me to serve the Lord with all my heart? My perspective of God. I see God as an amazing God. A merciful God, a graceful God that allows me the opportunity to, to worship him. And because of that, I don't want to bury anything in the ground that shouldn't be buried. But I want to take advantage of every day to praise him, to worship him, to study, to meditate on him, to come before his presence, his altar with boldness. I, I, I want to make sure that when I'm done with my life, that I have given God everything. Why? Because I see him as a wonderful Lord. I, I see him as a God that, that is amazing. You know, I, I've, I've uh, talked to people that have said, you know what, God failed me. And because God failed me, I, I just gave up and I quit. I got angry at God. I, I've, I've literally heard people say that they were angry with God because of things that happened in their life. 
And if you have that perspective of God, it will cripple you and it will not allow you to produce in the kingdom. You can't have faith if that is your perspective of God. Well, you know, I've dealt with this in my life. I've dealt with, you know, all these problems and God never stopped it. God, God allowed it to continue. And today I find myself in this state. Well, well, you have to understand that God allows us to go through things, but he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You can say, well, I, you haven't gone through the things that I have gone through. Well, let me tell you something. The God that allowed you to go through something has allowed me to go through something. But the only distinction or difference may be the fact that I know that I've gone through some stuff, but I'm still going to give them praise regardless. And regardless of what sorrow, pain, trials, and tribulation, I realize in every one of these cases, my God is good. He is a rewarder. My God is amazing. He's omnipotent. He's all power. He's omniscient. Uh, uh, he's omnipresent. He's, he knows everything. He holds everything. My God is everything. So understanding that, it causes me to move forward. It causes me to step out on, on, on stormy season and just about walk on the water. Why? Because I see him as a God that's calling to me and saying, I, I want to know you. I want to be closer to you instead of he's a God of judgment. He's a God with a lightning bolt in his hand that is just there to penalize me. It really has to do with our perspective of God. How, how do you perceive God? Who is your God to you? To some people, their God is one who failed them through the local church. And I'm here to tell you, a local church is going to have problems. And there are going to be people in the church that are more messed up in there than even in the world sometimes. But that doesn't mean that God failed you. It just means that that person wasn't where they should be. But God is always good regardless. God is always full of mercy and grace. And our God is always to be worshipped. And to be adored. You see, he saw his Lord as hard and unable to please. And not needing anything done with what was given. Why should I do it? I'm probably going to be judged for it. Why, why should I do it? I got a messed up past or I'm struggling with something. Why, why, should, I, why should I even try? His perspective was he's hard. He's unable to please. Can I tell you something about God? He's not hard to please. Because even when you're at your weakest, he said, I'll give you strength. At your worst moment, if you just call on me, if you just confess or repent, I'm right there. Even when you're living in sin. And because of that, we should have a perspective of God that, Lord, because you're good, because you're amazing, it is going to compel me to get outside of myself and to do more than I ever have done. Why? Because you have given me those talents, those abilities, those resources. You've given me a good church, a good ministry. You put me in the right place at the right time. You've allowed me to enter into the kingdom for such a time as this. And because of that, my God, I'm going to operate in faith. And I'm going to do more than I ever have. You see, his improper perspective caused him to be cast out into a dark place, a prison of sorrow. Again, I ask you this question. What is your perspective of the Lord? Well, he can come through for my brother or my sister, but he hasn't come through for me. Hmm. Not that he's not going to come through and he hasn't. It's just maybe you got to wait. You got to hold on. But he will bless you. He will answer your prayer. In the opening of this Bible study, I made this statement. I'm going to make it again. What we believe is evident by what we eventually produce. Question is, who do you believe him to be? Hebrews 11 and 6 tells us, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe, and this is good, that he is. 
He must believe that he is. It doesn't say that he is not. It says he must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Another translation says, but without faith, it is impossible to please and to be and be satisfactory to him. For whoever would come near to God must believe that God exists and that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly and diligently seek him out. You know who God is to me? He is a lover. He is a forgiver. He is a friend. He is an encourager. He's a God of second chances. Yes, he's a God of judgment, but of righteous judgment. He's a God of tender mercies. He's a God that looks past my faults. He's a God that, that ministers to us when we don't deserve it. He is a God that, that overlooks my weaknesses. He is a God that is amazing. My God is an amazing God. It is this perspective of God that allows me to continue to move forward. But if you ever let the devil plant those seeds of an improper perspective of God, then your faith is going to stop and, and you're going to let everything get in your way. Because there are problems in the church. There are problems with us humans. There's a lot of failure. There's a lot of carnality that we have to deal with. But yet, even in all of that, there is a triumphant church that is overcoming these things. And just because somebody failed you on the right, or you may have failed somebody, it doesn't change God's status. He is. For all the sicknesses and things that we have lost this Sunday, we, I'm not going to tell you, but we had a miraculous miracle this Sunday, even in our service. Why? Because God is. He is a healer. He is a deliverer. He's a renewer. He's a youth restorer. My God, my God is amazing. You have to have that perspective. You know what? God is when you see God in this manner, you can do the impossible. You can walk in a place of faith. And God is challenging some of you to get to a place where, you know, it's not just status quo or mundane, but you're walking in the supernatural. God is doing something phenomenal here. Not just here in this local place, but thank God it's happening here as it's happening throughout the whole body of Christ. But one thing that he is doing, he's moving on behalf of those who have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. You can't just have a normal faith in a God that is not normal. That's good. You can't just have a normal faith in a God that is not normal. Because he exists, his existence is enough to see him as one who is able to reward a diligent seeker. A diligent seeker. Our responsibility is, Father, every opportunity to worship you, to praise you, to magnify you, to seek you out. Even in the midst of my failures, even in the midst of my distractions, even in the midst of me falling down and, and struggling with life, I'm going to diligently seek you. I, I'm going to be more of a seeker than I'm going to be one who's down on the ground. And Father, I believe that you are going to reward me. I believe that you're going to bless me. I believe that you're going to increase my countenance. I, I believe that you're going to enlarge my borders. You're going to touch my family. You're going to strengthen in me. You're going to change the way that I think about life. You're going to help me with my attitude, my perspective, the carnality that I'm dealing with, Father, because you're a good God. And when I see you as a good God, it's going to make me want to be more like you. I'm here to tell you that God is holy. And when you see a holy God, it changes you and it compels you to walk in holiness. We've got to believe in his holiness, in his righteousness. 
And when you get a glimpse of his purity, his innocence, it causes us to want to be like him. Instead of seeing him as, and I don't mean this in disrespect to God, as jaded or mean or just of judgment. Because that's not who our God is. He will righteously judge that which is wrong, but he gives us time and he gives us seasons to get things right. That's why in the appropriate time and season, we've got to produce good fruit. Good fruit. Galatians 5 and 22. You could be at this place here if you have the right perspective of God. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of whose Spirit? His Spirit. Is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. I just think that we have, need a renewal, a perspective renewal of God. And when we can see them, him, excuse me, when he, we can see him as loving and joyful and peaceful and long-suffering, if, if we could just see that, it's going to cause us to operate according to the Spirit. Can somebody say amen? But if... We don't have the right perspective of him. Or, or shall I say, if we see God as flawed, if we see him in this manner, we are going to produce what we see. Galatians 5 and 19, which I should, probably should have read first, it says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, Witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. These works of the flesh are the direct result of actions that go against the very nature of God. Goes against who he is. That's why we have to be careful that we have the right perspective of God. And can I say there's also a perspective of God that also gets in the way, which is God really, does, maybe he doesn't care. You know, his grace covers everything and he doesn't, it doesn't matter how we walk. But the passage is telling us that if you are practicing the works of the flesh, again, if this is the fruit that's being produced in your life, if this is the works that are being produced in your life, not the fruit of the Spirit, something's wrong with your spirit. And maybe you see that... Uh, Maybe you see that God either can't see your situation or somehow he just alters the word of God just because you have a certain condition, just because you have a certain problem. I, I don't know what it is, but we have to make sure that these works of the flesh are not manifest in our life. Because if they are, we're not going to produce the fruit of the spirit. And I, you know, you'll also say that, you know, these last, probably last five days have, have been pretty amazing here. We've gone through so many different types of services. And, and I will say that there was a spirit of unity uh, amongst our church members and the workers that has been amazing. <laughs> On Friday night, you supported a, a concert. And I mean, our team, everybody was just so wonderful. And, you know, we had a wonderful healing service on Sunday, and, and then on Tuesday we had, you know, a, a, a celebrated dear sister's life, and even in doing that, people just showed up without having to, you know, call them or schedule, and they just showed up to help. Our staff was amazing. It was because you have a level of faith 
that you're going to operate in a spirit of excellence and, and, and you don't have to be pushed and you don't have to be prodded. But I believe it's because you have a perspective of God that, that your God is faithful. And when you see God is faithful, <laughs> it causes you to be faithful. When you serve an on-time God, it causes you to be on time. Hallelujah, somebody. <laughs> when you see your God as merciful, it causes you to be merciful to the saints of God. When you see your God in this light, it changes your perspective instead of, you know, everything being tainted. And, and, and hey, we all have our flesh, uh, maybe pessimism or life that has happened that has kind of tried to jade us a bit. But we have to look to God and say, you know what? I rebuke that. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be helpful. I'm going to be kind. And even when I'm struggling, I'm going to bless somebody. Why? Because that's who my God is. For 33 and a half years, we saw his life example, how he preached to them. He taught them. He cast devils out. He fed them. He clothed them. He, he put them in their right mind, and he, he, he was wonderful to children, and his example is exactly what we want to live. And when we see that and really see it through eyes of faith, this is what we, what we want to accomplish in our lives. This is who we want to be. And the beautiful thing is that our life is not over. We still have, your story has not been written. You still have an opportunity to make your fruit even that much more sweeter. To make your life, uh, the fragrance of your life just be that, that much more beautiful in his nostrils. Uh, you have an opportunity to, in your right season, to produce Love, joy, meekness, temperance. And if there was ever a season that is challenging, that it has been the season. Can somebody say amen? But by faith, not in our own strength, not in our ability. But when you see him as he is, and you see this is who he is, and these are the virtues that come out of him, the, the, his essence. This is what we aspire to be. You know, I think we, if you have discernment, you discern the things in your life that are challenging. And when, you know, some of you are rough in this arena, others are rough in a different area. And when we struggle in this different parts of our life, uh, we understand that and we know that that's why we come to God and say, Lord, I need help in this area of my life. I struggle. And as we bring it to him and we say, Lord, this is something that needs to be fixed in my life, we look to him as the author and the finisher of our faith, and we, we see perfection in God. And because we see perfection in him, it compels us to move forward, to grow, to develop, to get over, you know, challenges and addictions and vices that may try to enslave us in this life. But it's because he's perfect. And guess what? He's giving you his spirit. You've been forgiven of your sins. You've been baptized in Jesus' name you got the authority of the Holy Ghost. You have the ability to address these forces that come against you. But it's that perspective of him, I believe, that really is helping us to, to grow, to develop, and, and to keep moving. I do believe that our lives should speak for themselves. It's a testimony. Our lives really, you shouldn't have to tell people what you believe. Your life should exemplify that. They should sense the kindness in you. They should, they should see the, the, when you're stressed out or when you're going through a, a, a challenging time that there's something different about you. And again, there's times when we fail and we struggle, but that's not where we stay. That can't be what we're known for for being, you know, practicing a work of the flesh. No, there could be a time when we struggle, but that can't be our testimony. That can't be our MO. Well, you know, God knows, and he's going to have to just deal with me. No, God knows, and he's giving you the resources, the blood and the spirit to get over these things. That's why you've got to look to him and say, Father, I need your strength so I don't stay here. 
so that I grow, so that I develop. He's giving you everything that you need to get over. And sometimes it does take some time to get past some things. But as you're trying to get past something, wrestle with it in prayer. Talk to God about it. Confess it. Profess his righteousness over your life. I am the righteousness of God. I need your strength. I, I, I need your ability. I'll tell you what, as, as a preacher of the gospel, it's challenging. It's challenging. And I need his strength. I cannot do it on my own. But when I trust in him, he allows me. He allows me to be able to accomplish his will. And I'm realizing more and more, I just have to look to him and say, not my will, but your will be done. I need you, Lord, like never before. I said in the beginning that what we believe is evident by what we eventually produce. And I'll also say this. What we have believed privately will become public in time. What we believed privately, it, it'll become public. <laughs> and the factor is time. If you continue to walk into a place where you think that you're hiding certain things from God and even from the people of God, I'm here to tell you in time it's going to come out. There's been a lot of church issues that we just had to just pray about. We knew what was going on. We said, Father, protect your people. We know this is happening. But in time, it always works itself out. It always works itself out. Of course, there are times when God gives you a direct command as a pastor to, to address it in, in a particular fashion. But a lot of times, pray about it. I've laid hands on pews where there have been major problems. Sometimes those problems have taken 10 years to, for God to work it out. <laughs> but guess what? He did. And there will always be certain challenges in the house of God. But in time, you'll know. You'll know. Your life speaks for itself. If you're a sensual person, it's going to speak for itself. If you're a greedy person, it's going to speak for itself. It's going to become evident if you're a mean person, it's going to come out. You can, hold, you can try to hold it and try to hide it, but on time, you're going to have that time bomb moment where it's just going to, everybody's going to know. And we all have certain things that we are dealing with. My whole point is, if you bring it to God, let God help you with it, then he's, he's going to work it out of your life. Amen. But I really believe it, it's a matter of perspective on how we see God. If you practice perversion a good amount, it's because I believe you have a tainted perspective of what is holy. And, and again, it's not what you struggle with, but it's, it's what you practice. If it's adultery and fornication and these works of the flesh, then those aren't accidents. That's something that's continuing in your life. You have to bring that to Christ and say, I, I can't continue in this. But I believe true deliverance comes when you just see the holiness of God, his expectations, and you realize, you know what? I need to produce love, joy, peace, kindness. I, I, these are the things that I need to produce. And man, maybe, maybe you know, we're good on love and joy, but man, our peace is just like tiny little shriveled up fruit. God, we need you to help me in that one right there. Our patience. Oh, Lord. I won't tell too much off of myself, but I like to get things done in, in a second's notice. And I, sometimes I just need God's patience because I, I just, I, I'm like Speedy Gonzalez and everything that I do. I'm just, that, that also dated me. I don't know if some of you know, even know who that is. <laughs> I don't even know where that came from, but. But you know what? I profess his patience and he's given me more day by day. And I'm thankful that even though maybe I wasn't naturally wired to have a whole lot of patience, I've been rewired through the Holy Ghost to have the patience of God. Can somebody say amen? I will say this in closing that 
I really believe that Joseph had to have a perspective of God that allowed him to see past what his brothers did to him, what Potiphar's, uh, what Potiphar did to him, what the imprisoned, uh, those, they, those soldiers or, or the inmates that were in the prison, what they did to him. Every stage of his life, I believe he had to look to God and say, but God, you gave me the dreams. You gave me purpose. You gave me destiny. And everybody around me is failing me. And I believe, had he looked to those people, I don't think he would have made it. But I believe he looked to a God who said, I'm going to use you. But you've got to get through these stages of your life. And as you get through these stages, if you can just continue to see me and not fall for Potiphar's wife or not fall for being abandoned or thrown into a pit and not fall and stay in that season of your life, you're going to see something so spectacular and so, so wonderful in your life because he had a faith in his God. And it was evident by his choices, and it was evident by the fruit of his life. Whew. It was proof that he was able to make it through all these stages and these challenges that happened in his life. Thank God that he was that example to us. We have that ability and that opportunity this evening. I'm going to ask that you would stand with us or with me. I want to tell you all are a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people, and God has blessed us. God has blessed us to have a great family here, and don't let the devil tell you otherwise. I'm telling you. Because as much as we judge ourselves and we hold ourselves to a certain standard, there is a lot of love that is in this place. Of course, there is problems, but nothing like the promise that God has given every one of us. And where I'm going to encourage all of you to continue in your journey to, to be kind and to be loving and to be in that place because there is favor in your life, but you just have to get through the certain seasons and make sure that there is fruit when you get to the end of your certain challenges. Can somebody say amen and why don't we give God a clap offering? <laughs>